If we do really want to understand Western civilization, then of course we are going to have to understand the Bible. So today we'll be looking at the second book of the Hebrew Bible, which is of course the book of Exodus. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and welcome to the Western Renaissance. Exodus begins after Joseph and his brothers have all died. A new pharaoh is in control of Egypt, and he is a harsh taskmaster for the enslaved Israelites. Despite the brutal realities of their servitude, they continue to be fruitful and multiply. This angers the pharaoh, who wants to lessen the Israelites' potential strength, so he at first orders Hebrew midwives to slay all of the Israelite sons that are born, but they are unable to go through with it. Then he orders his people to throw Hebrew boys in the Nile. Fearing this, a Levite woman gives birth to a baby boy who she puts into a basket to float down the Nile with the hope that he will survive. The Pharaoh's daughter sees the basket and saves the boy. The wet nurse that she ends up using is actually the mother of the boy, and he ends up being named Moses because he was taken from the water. As he grows, he begins to hate the Egyptians for what they're doing to his people. At one point, he even kills an Egyptian who is beating a Hebrew. There is a witness to this crime, so Moses must flee from the Pharaoh. While in exile, he helps seven sisters get water from a well as a shepherd tries to run them off. To thank him, Moses is invited to dinner, and the father of these seven girls gives Moses one of their hands in marriage. Her name is Zipporah, and the two of them have a son named Gershom. During this time, God hears the cries of the Israelites who remained in bondage, and he remembers the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God appears to Moses on the mountain known as Harab in the burning bush. God says, Here I am, and asks Moses to remove his shoes because he is on holy ground. Moses hides his face so he cannot see God, and God tells him that he must save the Israelites and take them to the land of milk and honey. Moses is skeptical that he is worthy of the task, and he wonders how he could possibly convince the Israelites that he is sent by God. God says, I am who I am, and that he should tell them that I am has sent me to you. God then shows Moses some tricks that he can use to convince the Israelites and the Egyptians that he is sent by God. These include turning Moses' staff into a snake, turning the Nile into blood, and turning his hand leprous and then healthy again. God then promises to strike Egypt so terribly that the Israelites will be given gold and jewels just for them to leave Egypt. Moses still worries that he doesn't have the proper words to convince them, so God promises to give Moses and his brother Aaron the proper words. However, Moses is told that God will harden Pharaoh's heart, so convincing the Pharaoh will not be an easy task. This is generally interpreted to mean that God isn't going to force Pharaoh to set the Israelites free. Pharaoh is still guided by free will, and he is free to choose as he desires. Moses and his family set out for Egypt. Moses and Aaron don't have much trouble convincing the tribal elders of the Israelites that they are sent by God, but the Pharaoh is a much different story. In fact, the Pharaoh makes the punishment for the Israelites even worse, so they start to doubt Moses and Aaron as well. God tells Moses that he will make a new covenant with the Israelites, and he will deliver them to their land. God then has Moses perform a series of tricks for the Pharaoh, such as turning his staff into a snake. Pharaoh is not convinced because his magicians are able to replicate these tricks. God then punishes Egypt relentlessly until Pharaoh finally agrees to free the Israelites. These punishments include the Nile turning to blood, infestations of frogs, gnats, flies, dying livestock, boils on the skin, thunderstorms of fire, locusts, days of darkness, and finally, the death of every firstborn son. Before the tenth and final punishment, God commands the Israelites to take a perfect one-year-old lamb and slaughter it on the fourteenth day at twilight. They must then take the blood and put it on the two doorsteps and the lintel of the house in which they eat. They will eat the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They must eat it entirely, and anything left over must be burned. The blood on their doorstep will signify that this is the house of the Hebrews, and as God is killing all firstborn children, he will pass over the Hebrew houses. This, as you probably have guessed, is where the term Passover comes from, and this day was to be celebrated every year thereafter. 430 years to the day that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, they finally escaped, and they were given gold and jewels as they left. That didn't stop the Pharaoh's rage, though. 
He pursued them as fast as he could in his chariot with the rest of his army following close behind. The Israelites panicked when they realized that they were trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army. But Moses tells them not to worry, and he lifts up his staff and parts the sea. God also slows down the Egyptian chariots in the mud of the newly opened passage. When the Israelites make it to safety, Moses again raises his hand and the sea returns to its normal level, drowning the Egyptian army and the Pharaoh. The Israelites sing and dance in celebration of the Lord. The Israelites then set out into the wilderness of Sin towards the land of Marah. Days go by and they begin to weaken from thirst and they start to lose faith. Moses throws a piece of wood into an unclean body of water which purifies it and the people drink and their faith is restored. The Lord says, quote, If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I wrought upon Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. They continue on their journey until they begin to starve, and they again start to lose their faith. The Israelites complain to Moses, and the Lord hears it. God appears to Moses and says to tell them that, quote, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. End quote. In the morning bread appears on the ground, and Moses instructs the people, to distribute it in quantities to fulfill everyone's needs, but leave nothing until morning. This will continue until the sixth day, when they save the remaining bread for the seventh day, as they are not allowed to work on the seventh day. Some people do not listen to this and try again to gather bread, which angers God. Moses instructs Aaron to, quote, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations, end quote. The Israelites then ate manna for 40 years while they wandered through the forest of Sin until they returned to habitable land. The Israelites again began to complain of thirst, so God instructed Moses to take the people to the rock of Horeb and to strike it with his staff so that water would pour out. Unfortunately, however, a tribe called Amalek rose up against Israel and Moses sent Jacob to oppose them. Moses climbed to the top of the mountain and held up his staff. And as he held it, Israel was victorious. But whenever his arms would give out and he would lower the staff, the tide would begin to shift in the Amalek's favor. Aaron and a man named Hur began to notice Moses' weariness. So they sat him upon a rock and held up his arm with the staff. In the end, the Israelites were victorious and God promised to wipe out any remembrance of the Amalek. So Moses built an altar to the Lord. Soon after this, Moses' wife, sons, and father-in-law returned to the tribe. The father-in-law saw Moses acting as a judge to his people, and he disapproved. He counseled Moses to find some trustworthy men and, quote, Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to him, but decide every minor case themselves, so it will be easier for him, and they will bear the burden with him, end quote. Moses followed this advice. Then the Israelites head to the wilderness of Sinai, where God speaks to Moses and tells him that if the Israelites keep his covenant, they shall be his most treasured people. God tells Moses that he will appear on the third day on Mount Sinai, and that the people must wash their clothes, and no one can climb the mountain without God's permission. When the people go to the foot of the mountain, it is covered with a thick layer of smoke and trumpets sound down from heaven as thunder and lightning shake the earth. Moses and his brother Aaron were instructed to go up. There, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. 1. Do not worship any other gods. 2. Do not worship false idols. 3. Do not misuse God's name or do evil in God's name. 4. The seventh day is a holy day, and no work shall be done on that day. 5. Honor your father and mother. 6. Do not commit murder. 7. Do not commit adultery. 8. Do not commit theft. 9. Do not lie. 10. Do not covet your neighbor's wife or his possessions. He also gave Moses a list of rules for property, slavery, food, ritual, and more in Exodus 21 through 23, which you can read more closely if you so choose. Many Christians argue that Jesus fulfills the laws of Moses and that Christians don't have to follow them, so Christians generally don't care much for them. There are some interesting ones there though, such as, quote, you should not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt, end quote. Or, 
quote, when a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master, who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people, since he has dealt unfairly with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish the food, clothing, or marital rights for his first wife. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out without debt, without payment of money. End quote. The Israelites then make a burnt offering, and Moses covered them with the blood from these offerings, which formed a covenant. Moses also made an altar to the Lord, and Moses, Aaron, Nabam, Abihu, and seventy tribal elders ate and drank, and beheld God. In what form they beheld God, we do not know. Maybe it was Jesus that they beheld, or perhaps just a thick cloud of smoke again. We do know that later God appears on the mountain and that, quote, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel, end quote. Moses climbed the mountain again and was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. There God told Moses that the Israelites were to make the tabernacle for the Lord, which would be beautifully decorated and will contain an altar, a miniature ark, golden cherubims, and many other beautiful items. He gave precise instructions on how to, to do this and how it was going to look. He wanted the finest craftsmen among them to do this work. He instructed Moses that in the tent of meeting, outside the curtain, that is, before the covenant, quote, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a perpetual ordinance to be observed throughout their generations by the Israelites, end quote. Aaron and his sons, Nadab Mabihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, were to serve as priests. They were to wear beautiful vestments, quote, when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, or they will bring guilt on themselves and die. This shall be a perpetual ordinance for him and for his descendants after him, end quote. They are then instructed to take a young bull and two rams without blemish, and some unleavened bread, cakes, and wafers with oil. They must dress Aaron and his sons in fine clothing and anoint them. Then they must slaughter the bull at the head of the tent after Aaron and his sons put their hands on the head of the bull, and then take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with their fingers, and all the rest of the blood shall be poured out at the base of the altar. Then the Israelites should take all the fat that covered the entrails, and the appendage of the liver, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, and turn them into smoke on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and his skin and its dung are to be burned outside the camp in a sin offering. They are instructed to do the same with the rams. Then Aaron and his sons are to take in their palms, quote, one loaf of bread, one cake of bread made with oil, and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord, end quote. They will use this for the burnt offering to the Lord. The vestments from Aaron will be passed on to one of his sons who will wear them for seven days, and then they will eat the boiled ram and the bread, and anything that is left over shall be burned. The Lord gives them more instructions on further offerings, as well as instructions on how once a year each person over twenty is to give half a shekel as an offering to the Lord, and that in the tent between the altar and the meeting place there will be a basin where Aaron and future priests have to wash their feet before entering the holy place. Lastly, a special oil, like no other, will be made to anoint the entire tabernacle. While Moses is speaking with God, God sees that Aaron has constructed a calf out of gold, which the people are worshipping. This clearly goes against the idea that man cannot worship false idols. Moses is so angered by this that he throws down the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments and they break. In punishment for the idol worship, all the sons of Levi are ordered to kill their brother, their friend, and their neighbor, which ends up being about 3,000 people. The Lord tells Moses that those who have sinned will be blotted out of the, his book, and he casts a plague on them as well. The Lord then tells Moses to go to the land of Israel, and that God will not follow because they have not listened to him. Moses begs the Lord, and the Lord says, quote, I hereby make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform marvels, such as have not been performed in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among who you live shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you." End quote. He also instructs Moses not to let his people worship anything but him, and to not take wives from among the current occupants of Israel, because they will corrupt the faithful. Moses stays with him for forty days and forty nights, and recarves the Ten Commandments on two stone tablets. 
He is with the Lord so long that when he returns to his camp, his skin shines and his people fear him. However, their fears again returns to faith after Moses covers himself with a veil and he teaches them exactly how the tabernacle is supposed to look and all the rituals that surround it. They follow the Lord's instructions faithfully and Moses blesses them after everything is finished. A cloud then covers the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. When the cloud lifts, the people of Israel travel and every time the cloud of the Lord returns, the Israelites set up camp. Exodus ends there, somewhat abruptly, but Moses' story continues in the book of Leviticus. Still, the book of Exodus has covered many decades and packs a lot of events into a relatively short story. I hope that you have learned something in my explanation of the book of Exodus, and I equally hope that you will stick around as we continue the books of the Bible and many other great stories in history. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more. Thank you.